Welcome back to The Forecast, brought to you by Headstorm, the show that teaches you how to engineer growth by learning from industry luminaries to provide you with tactical steps you can use tomorrow. Hi, I'm John Humphrey, a guest host of the Headstorm Forecast. I've spent my entire career helping services companies grow revenue. Our methodology and software helps founders and business developers to grow sales. Check us out at connectforlife.com to see how our tools can help you grow your revenue. In today's forecast, Headstorm's CEO, Lawrence King, is joined by Kevin Pogany. Kevin is a senior director of engineering. He is at the forefront of pioneering data-driven solutions aimed at some of today's most difficult issues. Today, he's talking about his approach to bridging the gap between data and data science for growers. He's also going to give us an inside look at the convergence of four tech segments and how those improvements are stacking up for farmers. Kevin, it's an honor. Let's get started. The, uh, the context of growers, you know, there's some generational differences. You've got some that have been doing this for years, a lot of it manually, and, you know, perhaps they're starting to retire and some of the younger generations are starting to come up. Do you, do you see that, 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 you know, agriculture is one of those fields that you have to embrace the technology in order to, to be successful in the future? Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think you do. Uh, I think that the volume, here's why. Um, if you take a look uh, at, at the way farming had been done for, for probably millennia, it, it was largely based on the experience, right? Passed down from generation to generation. I'm not a farmer. I've had the luxury of traveling the world and talking with farmers, both uh, uh, let's call them young and old. And yeah, there's a fairly palpable difference between the generations. But to be fair, we've talked to many of the older generation that we consider part of the one percenters who largely adopted. In fact, they're partnering in in moving forward this whole digitization uh, of agriculture, uh, everything from the machinery and the sensors on the machinery uh, up and through the way they uh, leverage partners to help them drone uh, and, and uh, satellite companies, uh, additional feeds of information that come in from all types of, of, of vendors that help growers uh, at the tip of the spear really maximize their yields. And when you take a look back and, and take a look at average yields for those growers, we would consider those 1% uh, versus perhaps the rest. There's a pretty uh, obvious difference in, in, in outcomes at the end of the season for those types of growers. Now, that comes with some considerable cost, some expense. Uh, it, it, it can't necessarily be used across an entire grower's operation all the time. Uh, but this is part of that evolution. And so we're seeing it both with the younger generation, obviously more comfortable with using data and using um, uh, mobile technology and tools, uh, choosing to uh, find uh, partners and vendors that can help in, you know, inform the grower more uh, uh, readily about decisions they need to make. And, uh, and we're also seeing that, that experienced uh, grower set uh, really embrace uh, and leverage the, the tool sets, not because it's cool or because it's something that, that's natural to them, but because there's actual value at the outcome. Uh, they're seeing higher yields as a net result, which produces incredible innovation in, in, in the ag input space. You put these two things together and all of a sudden, both young and old recognize that, you know, this is like, I call it the chocolate and peanut butter. Like you put these two things together and, and it really is uh, just a, an all, a, a better outcome in general. Uh, it just can be a little daunting and, and there is risk involved. And so maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit later, maybe about how we're kind of working to partner with growers and, and sort of perhaps uh, sharing risk, I think, which I think is, is, a, is, a, is absolutely critical. Uh, if you want to, if you really want to start to embrace sort of the new model uh, for, for making decisions in agriculture. Today's most successful growers rely on technology. It seems like that's a common attribute regardless of the industry. 
The best logistics companies are leaning into technology. The best retailers, banks, and more are doing the same. So it's no surprise that early tech adoption for farmers is yielding results. Our next segment in the forecast will share how tech is driving value for growers. You know, we, we were speaking previously and you'd mentioned uh, that, that, that there's a couple different schools of thought in, in how you, you know, drive some of these outcomes or business value for growers. And I know one, one is on the predictive side. You can try to predict uh, events in the future and adapt along the way based on those predictions. And another, another fascinating concept that, that you talked to me about was this sense and respond model. And it, it, could you speak to that a little bit and kind of educate those who are watching uh, about what that is? And I know you gave me a little brief history lesson on coming from the military, and it was just fascinating listening to. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually a concept that's been around for for a while, uh, and it, it's it was adapted by the U.S. Air Force in their logistics business, but actually had been used in in a bunch of lean uh, early state sort of lean manufacturing principles, where you basically measured sort of the the outcome of a machinery that you're expecting and, and then you, you measure it against the actuals and that would tell you right away if you had a problem and i think you know that that's a very basic uh, model for quality uh and quality assurance i think the you know, the air force adopted adopted it in a slightly different way it was a lean mechanism but they obviously were using it to detect in a what are arguably in the supply, if you've been in the supply chain business, I, I had the luxury of spending three or four years in a, with a 3PL prior to my years in climate. And, you know, there's a lot of unpredictability in the supply chain. And, you know, we didn't talk much about that. I will in a minute on the ag side, but in, you know, in logistics, I mean, you can't control traffic. You can't control weather. You can't control if somebody right. calls in sick in a warehouse. You can't control the machinery potentially breaking down. Um, and for whatever reason, uh, you know, trucks don't make it to the dock on time and you've got, 120 truck truckloads of stuff to get out the door. How do you how do you make that happen uh, when five of them don't show up? Your, your well orchestrated plan goes out the window. So, you know the sense and respond topic uh, in, in logistics is about how do you really understand what's really happening in as close to real time as possible, and then adjust your plan. I think what's super fascinating uh, about the concept is that it, it is on its own is a purely reactive mode and model of, of doing business. Right. And it is extremely important. And of course, when you're talking about the military, I mean, all plans, you know, of all the things you could plan that, you know, go, you know, awry, you know, when, when things go really awry there, you know, things happen, people yeah. die. Uh, and so, you know, it's a pretty serious, um, doctrine to, to, that's followed in their supply chain world. I think when you take a look at ag, and let, so let's con, let's try, you know, let's kind of shift it over to ag, and let's let's tie this together. Really, what we're doing is we're applying data science to data, and we are attempting to provide the predictions uh, to growers. Uh, we don't necessarily want to tell them everything, but we want to give them guidance, and so that guidance is rooted in a combination of their own data. Uh, our data that we retrieve from very, very controlled conditions and research fields, and a bunch of information about our products, uh, some of which is domain and some of which is not. And, and through that, we uh, deliver recommendations. Uh, we deliver seed recommendations, what seeds should you put in the ground and at what density. Um, we deliver at some level uh, crop protection recommendations, uh, you know, how much or, or at what, even at what time uh, we think you should uh, apply a particular type of crop protection, whether that be fungicide or some form of, of pesticide. I think what is interesting is in agriculture, as in logistics, I mean, there's a reason that people can't predict an outcome. And that reason is because nature is nature. I mean, you're not, right. you, let, let's talk about weather prediction, right? Better yet, let's not, because it just gets us all upset. Uh, right. You know, at the end, you can predict weather and, and certainly uh, within the cone of, of, of predictability closer and closer to a time that, it, you know, that weather is going to impact you, you can get obviously much, much greater accuracy and even precision now. But I think that the, it, when it comes down to it, the reality is there are a, a ton of things about nature you simply can't predict and you'll never be able to predict. I, I shouldn't say never, but it, the likelihood of doing that prediction 
uh, let's say a year or six months before something happened is, is highly unlikely. Um, it's a level, I hope we don't get to a world where, <laughs> where we are doing that because that's pretty scary and that takes yeah. a lot of the fun out of it. Uh, but I do think is, as we start to see um, really kind of four things are converging. And you know, I thought about it this morning, you know, what are those four things that I think are pretty important that, that are driving this? You know, one is the ability for us to communicate anywhere on the globe now in near real time and not right. just with voice, but with data. Uh, so I think that, that, that the ubiquitous, uh, uh, the ubiquity of, of being able to communicate globally from anywhere um, is, is definitely a huge advantage. It allows us to effectively be able to send information um, from the four corners of the, of the world and, and get it in real time. Uh, so let's, let, that's number one. I think the, the second is uh, these, what, what I might call our uh, compact mobile sensory platforms are now becoming uh, very, very uh, commonplace and cost effective. So that might be drones. Those might be right. uh, autonomous uh, miniaturized robots. These are nothing more than sensory platforms. They carry other uh, devices on them that are ultimately sensing and then communicating either in near real time or real time uh, what those sensors are providing. So I think the, 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 the continued lower cost um, let's call it more equitable access to these sensory platforms, uh, either directly or through partners is becoming uh, reasonable economically and is increasing the frequency with which those sensors can traverse areas, right? So right. Th just a quick, a quick aside, like today, we have a device that plugs into equipment that captures data when that equipment drives over the field. We call it the, uh, you can also upload data that you know, your OEM, uh, John Deere case or other OEM providers naturally collect. The problem is those machines only drive over the field when they need to. Right. And the rest of that is done by hand with uh, people who literally walk out in the field. So I'm trying to give you a sense for why yeah. this is such a That's big evolution. Um, right. When I'm walking through the field, I still have the tactile feel and touch, and, and I can tell a lot as an experienced grower just from looking and, and touching. But if I can start to collect uh, information uh, at a very high resolution, either aerially or even on the ground at different times, and I can I can essentially generate the same outcome, but do it across a hundred acre field times okay. thirty fields right. I might have that by the way aren't all connected. They're in some of these are in five or six counties, like they can be uh, 20, 50, hundred miles from each other. Right. So the right. grower in their operation, and we're talking industrial farming, not uh, your small vegetable garden here, yeah. obviously, but you know, in that industrial farming space, you, you have a fairly large er area, right? 800 to 1200 acres is not an unusual size for an average operation in the United States. Uh, we start talking about Latin, you know, Latin America and Brazil and Argentina, we're talking about, um, many thousands of acres, right. Uh, that, uh, single operation has and in certain cases in, 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 in Eastern Europe and Ukraine, you have even larger than that. So the, the ability to walk a field and every corner of that field is, is very difficult. So having uh, the availability of, of these sort of sensory platforms that can autonomously to some extent and regularly traverse that field and provide information, uh, I think is a super uh, in, you know, important evolution. That's the second. The third is the miniaturization of sensors. So uh, what, you know, I, I was uh, on campus as an undergrad in Carnegie Mellon uh, back in 1993, watching the big Humvee right around Flagstaff Hill. Right. Uh, the Humvee was literally the military Humvee, the full-size military Humvee. It was humongous. It was filled. It was filled with the reason I had to be there and have such a big lofty view. It was the entire thing was filled with computers. It, literally the entire thing. But it was driving autonomously. It had LIDAR, had radar. Uh, had uh, cameras and was processing uh, that information in real time. It's back in 1993. Uh, the reality is that's all the computing power and all the sensors that are, you know, were on that huge Humvee that probably weighed like four tons, literally can be placed on a drone and flown on probably nothing more than, I don't know, a two foot by two foot square area. Um, yeah. And, and if you and, and a lot of the computation and, and interpretation can effectively even be done in, in near real time. So, you know, it, it's an incredible journey. It's been obviously about 30 years. I would expect this to have gotten here, I think, by now. Um, but it, 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 that miniaturization of sensors 
where lidar um, is, is you know can effectively you know be, be put on a on a drone and it weighs almost nothing and still produces the the output of, of you know lidar point clouds, uh, hyperspectral imagery, and then most importantly, uh, and what I think for agriculture is is a big deal is is high very high resolution imagery, um, uh, in, in okay. both optical, uh, visible, and and hyperspectral. I think that's super important when you start to get into matching the precision with which we are tracking um, the, the 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 planting of crops and arguably the harvesting of those crops. In between those events, getting an equivalent level of precision that doesn't require an individual literally to walk up and down every row and take a picture of every plant. I think that that is an incredibly valuable and and I think uh, transformational opportunity in in the agricultural space. And we've seen it happen now in a lot of other spaces. Uh, where high resolution imagery has replaced people on the ground. Uh, when I was at Navtech, uh, which is now here maps, we were, we were doing the same thing. We were moving towards how do we use um, LIDAR and, and advanced imagery to do sign detection, to create three dimensional fabrics of, of the roadway and of buildings along those roadways so that you effectively are mapping in three dimensions very accurately. You know where things are relative to everything else. And you're not spending a ton of time trying to interpret manually because you have enough precision resolution geospatial understanding of where things are that you can basically layer in attributes to a map and do it very very rapidly as you start to converge all of these technologies and 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 i would argue take the last one which is cloud computing and the ai capability evolution which kind of ties this whole thing together now you have an incredible ecosystem of technology that you can start to ingest greater and greater levels of data at higher and higher levels of precision and greater levels of accuracy, certainly understanding error and being able to correct for it. Now you take that and you can now fill the gap in what I would call the predictive outcomes. You can begin to fill the gap where predictions simply cannot accommodate for nature. Right. So that to me is the big, you know, that's the long, uh, the long, I guess, story of how I view it. Uh, and I think there's, uh, I think that's the next big journey in agriculture. And I think a number of other industries have already been on this journey. Uh, but I do think that's, that's kind of where it's heading. And uh, I, I'm starting to see some of that, uh, you know, pursuit already. And I think it, I think it will lead to, I think this sort of final outcome, which is, I can get very, very iterative in my predictions, but I can also uh, react exceedingly quickly, not just to the perhaps a disease in the field or a pest in the field, but I can react based on conditions in the field. And if I know weather conditions, um, or if I know the, the sort of plan or state of uh, growth stages for where crops actually are in their life cycle, I have predictive science that can tell me that. But to get the real verification of, of that in the field reduces the need for me to be as accurate about my prediction. So my prediction can help me plan, but my sensory capabilities can really help me execute, right? They can, right. They can effectively add that last level of optimization so that I'm still doing, I'm, I'm applying only as much um, crop protection as I need, or I'm applying as much fertility in the spaces where I really need it. Uh, and, and ultimately I'm interdicting to get the greatest yield out of my crop while doing it sustainably. So I think there's a, that, that's really where you kind of get to this, I think, end goal of, of blending the predictive and the reactive. So I see that converging now. And I think that's an, an incredible opportunity in ag and, and frankly, in other industries too. Having the right data makes all the difference in the world. How do you find the right answers when you need to know? What is the right time to plant crops and which crops to plant? Or how much water do, you, do your crops need? Which areas need pesticides and which don't? Sensory platforms and imagery help you collect that information quickly without the farmer having to patrol all of the fields. And now they can get a push notification on their phone with the results of all of that data along with what they should do to address any issue. Next up on the forecast, what are the indicators that agricultural companies are on the right path? Let me let me ask you a question. You know, we have a lot of, it, it, within our network, we have a lot of VCs, um, private equity uh, groups that are investing in agriculture. And um, 
I think I think it goes without saying there's a lot of companies out there that are offering solutions that don't necessarily have market fit. They really aren't focused on the outcome of either increasing yield or reducing costs. Mm -hmm. And so as, as, as a company or, or a group that that is you know, focused in, in investing in these areas, what type of opportunities, what types of technologies might they look for to help identify you know, some of these companies that, that are doing the right thing focused on the four areas that you mentioned earlier? Oh, that's a that's a great question, Lawrence. Um, you know, I think, like I said, I think the biggest opportunities are in in the continued improvement of the sensory platforms. The the, the whole the whole outcome of of agriculture um, and, and a lot of other industries is really tethered to our ability to sense in greater and greater precision on accuracy and velocity, uh, so that both the immediacy of getting that data, as well as the frequency with which we can capture it. So I think, you know, investments that are made in in our ability to capture that information in greater and greater intervals, uh, shorter shorter intervals, um, greater frequencies. I think that's an enormous opportunity. Why? Because data is effectively going to drive um, all of the AI uh, based outcomes and more data from broader and more variant uh, places provide that both regional or very uh, isolated specific area from which biases are, are eliminated just because it's within a region, but also helps us understand more broadly across the globe what some of the patterns are that we're seeing and how to broadly accommodate for those patterns. But I mean, I think that the, the, the real, real opportunity is how do you get data? How do you get more data more frequently, more accurately, more precisely, and, and have by far the largest um, set of, of, of customers and, and growers in agriculture contributing to that ecosystem? And, and that's sort of that data flywheel effect uh, that you see is, is beneficial to everybody in, in, in the business. And so I think the other opportunities that I think are super interesting, but I do think might be limited to some of the larger ag companies is, is the shift in business model uh, from um, just selling products and sort of in a fire forget mode, which, which isn't really how it works, but it's an analogy that helps to make my point here. Uh, since we don't, we, don't, we don't just drop a bag of seed on your farm gate right. and just assume you're gonna plant it and we're happy. That's, yeah. not, that's not how we operate, quite the opposite. Um, but I do think, uh, going back to what I had mentioned earlier, I think that in order to gain broader adoption from all the generations and to, uh, just like humans are incentive driven generally, I don't want to become a psychologist in this session, but you know, we're, we're motivated by incentives. Um, some of those incentives are financial. Some of them will be sustainability. Some of them, uh, will just be, um, the, the, the continuing ongoing, ability to farm uh, because that's what growers like to do. Uh, and so I think when you look at how do you evolve as a, as in the ag industry, how, how do you evolve as an input provider, given all of these objectives and sustainability, um, pricing pressures, uh, competitiveness, um, and, and really the, the model is uh, to start to share and risk with those growers. And so, you know, I can tell, you know, investors and others that would be looking at, you know, what's the future business of agriculture? Well, it's really in, I think, helping us to uh, discover, we like to say discover versus disrupt, but to discover uh, the models that help um, really bring the ecosystem of agriculture together. So everybody wins, right. um, the economic benefits are shared and all value created across the ecosystem um, become equitably distributed and, and recognized. We have to fund continued crop protection and seed, you know, input research needs to continue. Uh, we have to come up with new active ingredients for weed control and pest control. So there's a whole bunch of things that have to take place. Uh, right. You know, that's really the, you know, the, the focus is how do we start to shift to getting outcomes? to getting right. greater yields on fields. And so any organization that's really kind of pushing the boundaries in looking at the outcome of yield and, and or incentives to drive 
more sustainable practices in agriculture, uh, I think that's that's an area of, uh, I, I've been fortunate enough to have been in the early Nassian stages of that here. Uh, it's a super interesting, exciting space to be in. And it's, uh, it's definitely, to me at least, it's definitely the future. It's definitely where we want to go because it really aligns everybody's um, uh, both financial and, and outcome driven objectives and goals. Right. Uh, and, and, and so I think you, I do think it's a really, really uh, important uh, evolution. If I can't get yield on the field, then it doesn't matter what products I sell you, you're just not going to buy them. Right. And exactly. we're not going to end up meeting that, that, that goal, that 2050 goal. Right. So I have to share as a producer of, 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 of ag inputs, I have to share in that risk and I have to share in that outcome. Otherwise, you know, I have to, it just doesn't work, right? You can't just shift the risk to everybody else. So right. I think that's a great, it's a great evolution there. Next up on the forecast, what are the indicators that agricultural companies are on the right path? Data is driving positive outcomes for growers. It is letting them increase their yields while decreasing their costs. But all of that comes down to having the right information at the right time. The more granular the data you have on your fields, the better. If you have the data to know what's going on in your fields, then you can address it in the most precise way possible. The forecast next segment will give you the inside scoop on how to use sensor in precision agriculture. Stick around. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, high-res imagery and uh, a little bit about real-time communications. So I figured a good way to start off uh, this section would be to talk a little bit about software and then a little bit more about hardware, both at a high level, and then we'll do a deeper dive from there. Uh, so from the software perspective, um, there's a lot of approaches in software that already exist and show a lot of success. Uh, many of those approaches uh, include you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning or vision uh, to identify potential issues or risks or areas for improvement on individual farms or you know, networks of farms. Um, and there's a few companies that do this that I'll kind of touch on a little bit later uh, that I found kind of recurring through my research. Um, but as cool as these software solutions are, um, they do require effective hardware to be effective. Um, and so the hardware space does uh, provide a lot of opportunity for improvement. There's a lot of existing solutions out there, but um, I think, uh, admittedly, I think software is held back a little bit by the, the current hardware available. Um, I'd say the software is just a little more mature. Um, obviously, AI and machine learning can be improved. Uh, they're always improving. That's kind of inherent to the technology. Um, but as we get better and better hardware and better and better data, I think those software solutions can improve uh, more quickly. Uh, so all that to say, basically, I think uh, a lot of the potential innovation in ag tech right now is centered around hardware, at least from a technical perspective. Um, <clears throat> so kind of going a little bit deeper into high res specifically or imagery specifically, uh, there's two main methods that I found that I'll talk about, um, one of those being satellites and the other being drones. Um, both can be used for a lot of the same purposes, you know, uh, disease, pests, and weed uh, identification, providing general monitoring to crops and farms. Um, there's also obviously tons of differences between those two technologies. Um, the biggest one I'd say is probably cost. As you could probably imagine, uh, you know, a drone is going to cost significantly less even on the higher end than a satellite would. Uh, you know, you don't have to launch a drone into space, <laughs> for instance. Um, but another big difference is scale here. Uh, whenever you're thinking, you know, just like an individual farm or maybe just a couple family farms or something like that, I think a lot of times drone technology uh, makes a lot more sense. Uh, but when you start to scale up to networks of farms or entire communities uh, or start to go into the global space, um, I think it makes a lot more sense uh, to start considering uh, satellite imagery. Uh, it pro provides a lot more opportunities for analytics, and typically the satellites are um, part of, uh, you know, uh, companies that do all this analysis. So it's less on the farmer and more on companies to handle. Um, but overall, uh, I think that uh, they both will allow a, a lot of the same uh, benefits, which I'll go into. So satellite imagery specifically, like I said, there's several companies that are currently providing, you know, this sort of Im imagery service. Um, they do a lot of the same things. It's just kind of, I think it's either availability or just kind of preference down to a user, maybe whoever they run into first. Uh, one of the major benefits that they all provide is consistent access to aerial views of fields. 
I think it's a pretty major, um, you know, a major benefit regardless. Um, satellites can also track weather or environmental factors and hazards, which can help uh, farmers to be a little more proactive in preparing for either changes in weather or extreme weather events on the horizon. Um, and several of the companies like Gamaya, CropSafe, and Earth Daily Agro that I found uh, do provide warnings and suggestions and alerts based on this sort of information already, um, which I'll touch on briefly uh, in just a couple slides. And although I'm focusing on imagery primarily here, um, I do think it's noteworthy to mention that uh, a lot of different things with sensors and other data can or are incorporated to make the imagery as powerful as it is. Um, you know, whether that's from weather stations or soil probes or, you know, other sorts of sensors like that. Um, but you might be surprised to know how many things that imagery alone can provide for. Um, they can do all sorts of things like providing for estimated or estimates on crop biomass, soil hydration, nutrient levels, and like I mentioned before, disease and pest and weed identification. Uh, it can help with uh, predicting and, I guess, tracking weather, uh, crop damage, scheduling assistance on a farm, all those sorts of things you can get almost exclusively from images. And then it just becomes more powerful when you start incorporating other technologies. Thanks, as always, for tuning into the forecast brought to you by Headstorm. With your hosts, John Humphrey and Lawrence King. As part of this vast community, we hope these tips and insights will make a difference, future-proof your business, your mindset, and help you surpass your expectations. Feel free to reach out. Our contact info is in the description. Hope to see you next time as the forecast brings you more thoughts from industry leaders and strategies to engineer growth.